funding of the EU is, uh, is, a, is a science society uh, uh, project. This means that it's oh, on MML. This means that it's, it's called a collaborative action. It's not a strictly speaking a, a research uh, project, but we could use these resources for doing research with activists. This is basically what we do in Nijon. Nijon stands for Environmental Justice Organization, maybe the central uh, and, and was granted with a bit more of uh, 3.6 million euros, which is what happy at some point. It involves 23 organizations from 23 countries from all around the world. Uh, in Israel, we have a uh, more or less uh, equal representation <coughs> of uh, activist of organizations and research centers. And uh, mm, within this very heterogeneous uh, uh, world, this, uh, the world of environmental justice organizations, we, we have both big networks, uh, very well known in the respective areas, and then a small networks that are operative for a specific uh, uh, topic in a specific part of the world. Uh, basically, what EJOL uh, do, does is, is to promote collaborative research in strengthening spaces of resistance against environmental injustice in some kind of thematic areas, because of course there are, we could be working in, 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 in all possible thematic areas, but we selected some that are developing in the nuclear industry, the world of uh, fossil fuels, uh, biomass and land conflicts, uh, mining, and then management of uh, toxic waste. This is more or less our focal areas. And then we have some thematic interests, uh, some, sorry, some cross-cutting interests that are related with environmental health, economic evaluation of liabilities, uh, legal developments and environment. And then this is the reason why we are here in Lund, uh, uh, working also this conceptual development on ecological debt and, eco and ecological decentralization. <coughs> this is we are very grateful. It's led by uh, our professor at Cornell. Uh, Even is rather action oriented, so we are kind of uh, developing all these policy recommendations. Uh, we try to feed in kind of some some dialogues that are uh, now going on on in this um, field of this environmental justice. And we do also uh, as much work as we can indeed in, the, in relation to dissemination, we will see this later. Uh, in uh, the methodology we use, is basic, uh, it, it includes different tools. Uh, Lea Tempa afterwards will present us this uh, map, um, the mapping exercise database, the collection of cases of environmental justice and injustice we have been detecting around the world. Uh, a basic uh, uh, way of organizing dialogues and also organizing workshops on different topics, uh, mining, health, etc., in different parts of the world. And these are then uh, synthesized in some reports. This is what I will be talking very briefly. Uh, we are producing also uh, conventional uh, research uh, outcomes as uh, research papers, census papers, books, etc. We are very happy. Uh, that we were uh, recently at, uh, accepted a uh, special issue in Geo Forum, oh, where many of you entitled fellows are collaborating. So we were so, so happy about this. Oh. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also an online uh, course that is now entering its uh, fir the first edition, videos, uh, documentaries, etc. Okay. Uh, this is how the atlas looks like. We will, you will see it uh, shortly. In, uh, in some minutes, uh, but what I'm going to present you just, I mean, probably you know them, okay, is the series of uh, reports we have produced. These reports are basically the outcome of uh, real collaboration between groups. Okay, <laughs> this is not working as I wanted. Um, uh, uh, this is the outcome of a real collaboration between activists and uh, researchers sit together to produce something. And this is not easy. I mean, uh, it, it entails, um, let's say, a plastic attitude from both uh, acti uh, activists and, and researchers, but it's, it's been really, really interesting. Uh, and what even, oh, sorry, <laughs> this is uh, working without me. Okay. There is this series of, of reports, and I wanted to kind of uh, list each one of, it, of them. You can go back. Uh, go uh, back. Okay, go back. Sorry. I didn't, okay. Sorry. So I'm trying to take control of this. 
I'm just, <laughs> uh, well, we have this first report uh, on industrial waste conflicts around the world that entails cases in India and Bulgaria. Then we have, oh, sorry. <laughs> then we have a case, uh, a series of cases about uh, failures in a CDM, um, a CDM mechanism in Africa and a reflection why this uh, strategy is not going to solve let's say the climate problem and it's not going, it's not going to help either communities in, in the different parts of the world where they are implemented. Then we have an outlook, an overview of the industrial tree plantation conflicts around the world. Okay, I'll list them. <laughs> then we have a very, an interesting, we think, uh, report on um, uh, how legal avenues can be used in support of environmental justice organization. Thank you. Um, then we have a, a reflection on how the economics of ecosystem studies and biodiversity can be done in a very different ways and then support uh, issues in also very different ways. And we have, we have to be careful in the kind of uh, economic analysis we are doing when we're dealing with the biodiversity again. Okay. Um, we have an overview of mining conflicts around the world based on case studies. Uh, there is then a guide on the use on environmental uh, on um, on multi criteria evaluation for environmental justice organizations. <coughs> we have then a, a, a set of case studies on uh, liabilities in the world of oil. So, for instance, there is a review of the case of Shell in Nigeria, but also in Italy with uh, your colleague in the project, uh, Lucy Gray, who has been leading this this work package, uh, this uh, this report. And more recently, the, th the three more recent reports. And again, a, a set of case studies about land grabbing uh, conflicts and resistances. Um, then a book that puts together the, de the debate, uh, the, the discussions on ecological debt and the legal implications on ecological debt and what does it entail in terms of the developments in the international law. And finally, uh, a review of cases where there have been uh, an assessment of liabilities and how this assessment of liabilities can, can be uh, undertaken and then used in, uh, in the uh, strategies of environmental justice organizations. This is what we have produced so far. And uh, there are seven more, conflict, uh, so seven more uh, reports to come. Uh, we uh, would like to offer this as a, as a, as a resource for uh, researchers who are interested in building on the discussions. Of course, this has been done, uh, I, I say again, in the context of this dialogue with, uh, with issues. So it's not a proper research outcome, but I think it, it creates, uh, it builds a lot in this idea of uh, activist knowledge, and uh, which is one uh, basically of our, our uh, basic standpoints in, in Asia. So uh, for, for finalizing, um, one thing that we try to do uh, intensely in, in, the, in, the, in the project is to engage uh, the public in, uh, into the discussions we uh, have it with these uh, environmental justice organizations and we use certain resources, for instance, exploiting the, uh, uh, the tool of, of successful cases. What were the strategies when there was something that an environmental justice organization considered a success? Uh, there is a, a regular update of, uh, a blog, of, of our blog. We have a very active kind of, uh, set of bloggers. You are invited, or you, if you are interested, in include one of your uh, papers um, as a blog. Uh, we also produce videos and podca podcasts and other kind of tools, not strictly um, uh, scientific uh, outcomes, but also include scientific outcomes in the, uh, in the resource library we are producing. What happens often is the scientific outcomes cannot be used by, uh, by, by regions because they cannot access our libraries. I mean, are we, are we aware that when we're <laughs> working uh, in environmental justice, political ecology, uh, <coughs> point of view, what we produce afterwards maybe it's not uh, there available for the agents to use because they cannot access the libraries. I mean, we have to, to be aware of this and see how I mean we, we are delivering these 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 outcomes to the general public, and then we use also an intern and an intern, uh, intense use. We make an intense use of social networks. And I see only as an, an anecdote, we really take every chance we get to. Uh, put 
social, I mean, uh, the, the interest of, of the audience or the public uh, as a whole uh, in the topic we are, um, we are kind of addressing. And I will show you when we have a peak in the access to our resources and what we were offering. We had a peak when we had this picture. I mean, uh, probably you saw this, uh, this was uh, circulated in November last uh, year. This was taken, uh, basic, was taken by uh, one of our EGEM collaborators, who by private, uh, for, for private reasons, was granted um, an audience with the pop, and then the pop uh, got, I mean, took these pictures. The day we published, I mean, one, one, one of the first, more or less at the same time than the Guardian, we published this picture, we had a peak in the access to our outcome. So I think, uh, although this can be a bit controversial, we actually try to use the resources we can to, to, to draw public attention on this matter. Oh, okay. <laughs> it says, um, it is supporting this campaign of water is worth more than uh, gold. No? And it, he also took this other picture with, uh, anti, uh, with an anti-fracking, uh, let's say, so in support of an anti-fracking campaign. No? Okay, well, this is uh, all the song. Uh, now, I think we will be talking about more serious matters and the kind of discussions we have. We want to present the kind of uh, activities we have been uh, doing this last year. I'll not join. Okay. So I invite uh, <coughs> to argue a little bit against what was said in the morning. I don't know, in this very good lecture we had in the morning, really good summarizing the theory of social movement, but in which it says the environment is about the globe, uh, who are the subjects of the environmental movement. Well, well it's true, it's about the globe, but I mean, there, there are different kinds of environmentalists, and one of them <coughs> is the uh, environmentalists of the poor or the indigenous, and this is what we are talking about, and I think that there is a kind of global environmental justice movement that we are helping in a way, in a little way, but also discovering, although it's already discovered before. So what we're going to say, I'm going to talk now as quickly as I can for about 15, 20 minutes, then I'll come back with summarize what we discussed in the conference about ecologically and equally change or whatever he wants to say, and the future book we are going to buy from the conference. And then after a short, uh, perhaps 10 minutes, if you can, uh, sort of um, uh, break, we'll hear Professor Paul Mohai, who is one of the uh, people who was involved and wrote about the environmental justice movement in the US from the 1980s, and a professor of Michigan University. And then three of the students who have been collaborating with the map which will be uh, talked about by Lea Tempa in the last uh, half an hour or 45 minutes. So we'll finish within 15 minutes late, but which is within Swedish punctuality, as we've seen in the last few days. This is an average of Catalan and Portuguese punctuality, so it's not very punctual. So I'll try to be punctual in a Catalan way. <coughs> so the environmental conflicts at the commodity frontiers, distraction conflicts keep increasing, and they convert <coughs> all the movements complaining against this. One can see them as converging into a global environmental justice movement. And of course, a lot of the things discussed is this question of valuation, which the book was shown with this T-shirt, whether gold is worth more than water in which units, isn't it? No, he said the other way around. Water is worth more than gold. Uh, and, and this kind of valuation contest, but, and who has the power to impose a standard of valuation? Well, the mining company would say gold is obviously worth more than water, isn't it? Per kilogram, clearly. So in what sense we can discuss environmental conflicts, valuation languages, and power issues, who has the power to impose the procedure to decide on the changes in the social metabolism. And each of which we have not invented because we said in the States many people had already used this, but we thought for some months that we had invented the acronym, but was invented before, 
means environmental justice organizations. And it means, uh, and many of these that are listed here are environmental justice organizations, like OCMAL in Latin America, all what, or they are really networks of environmental justice organizations. And they have not created the conflicts, this is obvious. On the contrary, they respond to the conflicts, mm -hmm. forming mm -hmm. these organizations and forming these networks. And here there is a short list. The last one is people who are complaining against extractivists in Latin America. They have not yet formed a network. They are more intellectual, political people. But this will come probably soon. So this, I have some pictures which are self-explanatory. And this is from Mexico. In, on a sacred territory in Mexico, these people complain. So it's sacredness against mining. And we think, and Ralph Comborg and myself have been on this for a few years already, that this sometimes is difficult for people coming from, all, from depending on the intellectual tradition they come, the discipline they come, to grasp this idea of the social metabolism of the economy. Anthropologists can do this if they remember Roy Rapaport, and, uh, but for historians, economic historians, especially for economists, it's very difficult to go into this, and little by little we are managing to convince some of them. And Marx didn't use this word, this stuff, Wechsel, meaning metabolism, but he did not develop it into accounting of energy and materials, and this is obvious. But neither he nor the successors down to whoever, Hobsbawm or whoever we can admire as Marxist historian, they didn't not do this. They did other interesting things, but not metabolic accounting, isn't it? This has been done by other people. People like this, with the new environmental economic history, I would put Rolf Peter Seiferle, perhaps as one of the earliest ones in Europe, isn't it? Put this book, which is called The Subterranean Forest, which is about coal. And all these people, and of course now there are a very large number of people doing this kind of history, but also this kind of uh, so, uh, social metabolic uh, studies, industrial ecology at world level, like Marina Fischer-Kowalski and her group of people in Vienna, for instance. So this is not a complete list, but there are also some Italians. Stefania Barca did this for water in, the, in your first book, isn't it? not for materials or energy, but some other people have done. And the methods to study social metabolism, which people in a school of what is called political ecology should learn, because what is the ecology in political ecology? I think the ecology in political ecology is here in understanding these methods and then trying to get somebody to help you if you need to do it, and because one cannot know everything. I have no idea how to calculate virtual water, for instance, but I know somebody who knows. So I, if I would need it, I would. Ham means human appropriation of biomass, of net primary production, depending on what you study. And if we study, for instance, somebody, this morning we had a short discussion on post-materialism. Well, can you say that Latin America is moving toward post-materialism when the intense eh, the domestic extraction has uh, increased four times in in 40 years, isn't it? and in the world more or less like this, but not in Europe. In Europe, much less. But in the in, in, in India, for instance, it's even faster. So this is what. But this, of course, is not just a figure. It means that there are conflicts arising from this, and these conflicts. We see now because uh, there are lots of conflicts of <coughs> extraction, but also even from the economic point of view. Well, this is also economic point of view, the materials, but from the crematistic point of view, which is called the Pope men, that uh, water is worth more than gold, not in the crematistic scale of measurement, in use value, not in exchange value. So if we look at the at the crematistics and the money accounts, we see that many Latin American countries now, they are not even 
uh, able to balance the commercial accounts. So they export my more, much more than they import in tons. And nevertheless, in the last two years, they are not even balancing the commercial balance, the trade balance. And this shows how much the net exports in tons of Latin America have increased. Somebody would say this because of China, but it's all, not only China, it's all the countries. So. So this I have already said. Latin America, and this explains the conflict, the polemics that Diego here knows very well, for instance, on the post-extractivist uh, sort of line that some people are saying in Latin America, because the argument is we're exporting a lot in towns, we are causing lots of environmental conflicts, and nevertheless we cannot even balance the external trade accounts in money. And Argentina has just devalued a few months ago, and they are also they are going to get increasingly indebted because of this, which is what I explained here. So we can support first a study, and then support, as I put here, and peacefully promote perhaps these conflicts, environmental conflicts, both for three, not both, for three reasons. The people who are suffering them, the environment which is suffering them, but also because the economic policy, one can argue, is totally wrong. It's just getting again into a dead trap in due course, mm -hmm. like Ecuador is doing with China by selling all in advance, isn't it? <coughs> and this is why it happens on the ground, more or less, or in Quito. These people here are complaining at the Chinese embassy a couple of years ago against Chinese mining companies. And the second is uh, Yvonne Yanis, who was here in our conference. So she's an activist. We are pseudo-activists, I think. Or you perhaps not even a pseudo. I am a pseudo-activist. But she's a real activist. We had a few in the conference thinking activist, because this is very clever to invade the Chinese embassy without the police stopping them. They didn't stop the project, but they were complaining against it. So this is about mining, it's not about anything else. These are the protests in Peru, again, <coughs> gold mining in this case, and they complain because of the water. <coughs> in a march to Lima, they are starting the march to Lima in the spring, it was in May, I think, two years ago. And this, if we go beyond Latin America, we find the same thing everywhere. I just read a few days ago about China, because there is somebody called Anna, Anna Laura Wainwright in Oxford, who is studying not big pollution cases in cities in China, which is relatively easy to do, and complaints. She's studying rural complaints in China in what they call in China uh, cancer villages. And this has been adopted even by some people in the Communist Party in the top. So now they can talk more about it, and this is one thing. And she explains this using words like popular epidemiology from the environmental uh, justice movement in the States, and also she uses Jim Scott everyday forms of peasant resistance. The peasant resistance, very subdued resistance against pollution. So in the morning we're talking about social movements. Is this a social movement? Well, if they have got already a name, like cancer villages, isn't it? would be much easier, I suppose, in the Chinese way of doing things, which is not, it's not an ethnic thing, it's a political situation of complaining against this. But of course, in India, there are hundreds of women, and they are coming together to some extent in this new party, the AAAP, with Meda Patkar, for instance, an activist against dams, very well known around the world, as one of the candidates now for parliament in India. And which perhaps is not very advisable because the party might swallow up the movement, perhaps, but this is what happens, and so on. So, in the others, we collect these kind of struggles and we want to reach 2,000. Not, it's not a magic number, it's a feasible number in the next year. And we are getting some help from some entitled, but we are asking for more help, little help from you. 10 cases, every one of five cases, would be being so well-trained people 
you will be very well done. Ask these people, the young people from Michigan, who were brought here as a model, <laughs> <laughs> have been doing for their own good also, isn't it? Yes, for the US. <clears throat> so moving to India, let's move to India just for a minute. This is a picture taken already six years ago, mm -hmm. or seven years ago, really, in, in, in Odisha, on a killing. And this is, they are praying after, one year after, the, 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 where the, the things took place. There are so many cases like this around the world. Many people get killed on the environment. It's not very post-material, isn't it? It's rather, uh, there are hundreds of people killed fighting for livelihood and the environment. And depending on the country, there are more or less, depending on the culture, there are more in Mexico and in Colombia than than in Spain, I don't remember, well, I remember a few in Spain, but in the transition, anti-nuclear victims, also in, in Europe, there have been victims uh, in demonstrations, anti-nuclear, but not so many other places. So, and because of this, we have just published, I think it's today that came out in India, this paper with also the Atemper, the people from Barcelona on this, and here we show the, this thing that, the, that we have the material flow, this comes from syndrome sink and other people. If you look, the first two things, the one first is the absolute extraction of materials in India divided by category, and the one to the right above is per capita. Per capita, you can, perhaps you can see the figures, three, four tons per person per year. In Europe, we are about 15 tons. In Spain, we went up to 20 tons in 2007 in the useless building boom we had. So five tons is not very much yet. But India, if you look at the lower left, this is the trade in material terms, in percentage of the total extraction or consumption of materials. It's very little compared to any Latin American country where they would export in tons, like Brazil or northern Brazil, perhaps 10%, uh, 20% of the whole material extraction who goes to exports, no? iron ore, soybeans. In India, trade is very little in money terms also compared, in money terms compared to GDP and in tons compared to total tons. So India lives from its own resources, plus some imports from oil from the Middle East, from Australia. Therefore, the conflicts are internal. So there is ecologically an equal exchange between Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Charhan, and the rest, but not either they are not exploited too much and they are not, cannot yet exploit anyone. This is very different already from China. So we have all these conflicts that we put in this <coughs> article on India and we, and we also, some examples, isn't it? But we would know the statistics of all this statistics on environmental conflicts that we have some for India we have already I think 120 cases in the map and other people can do this I and mean, how many conflicts are in India environmental conflicts nobody knows I mean, thousands perhaps isn't it? or tens of thousands and then we have this idea also that is not only extraction is also waste disposal and it's very clear because quite a few of you are doing the case of Campania, isn't it? It seems to be so popular among this group uh, and deserves to be because it's really scandalous and big. But this happens, in, and one, the biggest perhaps, depending on whether we consider also uh, water pollution, but the biggest waste disposal conflict in the world is of course climate change, isn't it? Because it's excessive amounts of greenhouse gases that we cannot dispose of and we put them in the atmosphere. And when they want to put them in, in red schemes, in tree plantations, people complain somewhat. And there is also a movement, therefore, for climate justice. In Copenhagen in 2009, there were lots of people in the street with banners of climate justice, or pay the climate <coughs> debt, pay the ecological debt, the carbon debt. And also there are movements in the world calling themselves now water justice, or in Latin America, justicia hídrica, because they like drink, I suppose, hídrica, isn't it? That's what they call them. 
uh, which is the same thing. And so this exists and is part of the global environmental justice movement. This is a summary from a work from somebody from Barcelona and other people. Look at the article published in Economic and Political Weekly in Delhi and in Mumbai about this Delhi conflicts on Delhi or Pune or Bogota, also so many places on who is the owner of the waste, the urban waste, where the recyclers can use it and make a living out of it and how they should make a living in what <coughs> hygienic conditions, where the people who want to take hold of the urban waste and incinerate it for, for money uh, or do all things for money, isn't it? So this is something which is not very European or US, this kind of conflict is for, but it's a very Mexican conflict, for instance, in which the role of urban recyclers, even being useful against climate change. You know. We are writing now an article finishing on the political ecology of water, copying a little bit from Sumida and all people who were here in the room earlier. And, uh, and it's the same thing, the water social metabolism, which is different from the natural cycle of water, the interventions in the hydro, in the social cycle of water, and who does them, who benefits, who suffers, and the kind of conflicts around them uh, classified into different categories. And because of all this, we published a book, which is this book, which is the cover is the best thing in the book, to tell the truth, and it comes from meetings in, from a girl in Colombia, daughter of a well-known activist, and 22 years old when she did this, for a conference in Darwin, precisely on climate change, the parallel conference, and with this slogan of leave the oil in the soil and keep the coal in the hole and keep the gas under the grass. We are adding things to the <laughs> to this thing. I think there's another one still, the tar sands under the land. So we can add things. And this, of course, because of climate change, clearly, but also because of the local. So when these things go to Darwin with not with a book, with a banner. This is taken from a big banner. And they say this, I think, this is a movement, isn't it? It's a social movement. It's not a post-material movement at all. It's the movement of the environmental justice in the variety climate justice, or in the variety fighting the oil companies or the coal companies, and this putting these things together. <coughs> this is a new book, and the, this is the cover of this book, which is not so new, but which is the book before, the book before uh, the EJOL project. We have done some edited issues also with Dr. Scalis and the people on this idea of social metabolism, ecological distribution conflicts, a systemic thing, and the movements and the evaluation languages. And this comes from Darwin on the same occasion. So this I like very much, and we found it in the internet, isn't it? Because down it says, don't burn the fossil fuel. <coughs> but it's signed by Friends of the Earth Nigeria. Friends of the Earth Nigeria is IRA, Environmental Rights Action. Godwin Ojo was here in our conference and gave a very good speech. And these are the people who come from Ken Sarawiba and the people killed in 95 by Shell under the dictatorship in Nigeria. And Shell has been there since 30 years before, 95. So it's one of the longest fights between local people, the Ogoni people, the Ijo people, non-violent, afterwards violent, violent from the state all the time, but from the people, first non-violent, then violent, and in which case still has no solution, no payment for any kind of reparations, nothing. And they have lost the case, or more or less lost the case, in the Netherlands, in judiciary. And the top says this slogan and is signed by All Watch. All Watch is a kind of network, international network, born from Nigeria and from Ecuador in a few months after Ken Saruiba was killed. Ken Saruiba and eight, nine of his companions. So all this is uh, put together in this uh, journal article, which just appeared here months ago, which is a very long journal article with a very long list of authors, as you say, 
And this came out of a meeting we had in Nigeria in one year ago inside EJOL, and we decided to write an article, and we should write it shorter and send it to science or nature or somebody according to there, and we have to do this. But the idea here is what I explain now about this article. Some of them, some of you can just look at it right now if you got it because this is in open access, Journal of Political Ecology. I realize the editor is Simon Butterbury he said, I we have no impact factor because the new journal, no impact factor at all, zero impact factor. And so I'm very much relieved because I thought you get negative impact factor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I quite often write in places with a negative impact factor, politically negative impact factor. Mm -hmm. So we are neutral, no impact factor, positive or negative. And, and, but, uh, and then the point of the article is that this movement of environmental justice, which exists globally, and we are discovering because of one of the theories that was explained in the, in the morning. Because of the consequences, isn't it? Because it's, we find the evidence in many places. <coughs> How did you call this? It was the, the last one you showed, the, the union the theory, isn't it? The outcomes, because of the outcomes, at least in terms of, also they do demonstrations, they, do, they invent words. And this is some of the words they have invented, including here, some of the words from Via Campesina, which of course is a peasant international or, or a landless people international also, but which uh, is very much on the <coughs> issues also. Food sovereignty is, divide, is, is defined from an environmental point of view also. So if you go through the list, you could sing on other words, perhaps other slogans, other concepts, notions, that have been promoted over the last 20, 30 years by different groups. And also we have like local ones, like Eco Mafia in Italy, isn't it? Or the Sun Mafia in India, or these kinds of villages in China. So in all our languages and places, we could find local expressions of groups belonging, whether they know it or not, to this global environmental justice movement. So this is the last one, another advertisement because you still have two days to start this online course, uh, but many of you are far too advanced to do this, but this is meant for anybody who wants to take this online course, who knows English and has a computer. So it's about 5% of humanity we have calculated, 10% at most. Number. So yeah, a huge number of people who can take the course and pay $300, so it reduces still more. Um, <laughs> But it's not the whole of humankind. Is it? I don't know how one could reach the whole of humankind. There is no, perhaps the Pope would have some idea. <laughs> <laughs> but even the Pope right, is about three, not to one tenth of humankind. So anyway, that's uh, what I wanted to say. And now Alf Combor is going to talk, and then we we'll try to have five minutes for discussion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> very much, Juan, and uh, Bea for giving such a good introduction to EJOL. I made some copies. Could you distribute them yes. of the program for this EJOL workshop that we yes. had Thursday and Friday? And uh, we had, a, I, I'm, I must say, to begin with, I'm extremely pleased with this two-day conference we had Thursday, Friday. Uh, it was really amazing, the variety of uh, contributions that we had from all over the world and from a variety of perspectives also. Now it's a bit early to, to digest what was actually being said there, but we will produce a volume from this conference which I think will be very, very special. Uh, not least because of the huge variety of, of perspectives. Um, I could just mention that we had uh, uh, several contributions talking about material flow analysis and physical trade balances, which is, which is one uh, approach, a uh, very prominent one, to ecologically unequal exchange. But we also had papers discussing conceptual issues uh, and uh, questions about how we should talk about environmental justice and ecologically unequal exchange. And uh, I think there was a convergence there between some academics and, and some activists who were really concerned about 
using the right words and how easy it is to be co-opted into the vocabulary of um, hegemonic, conventional economic theory. And once you're in that discourse to think in Foucauldian terms, then you're, you're, you're stuck. And, and uh, the power of language is, is very, very uh, uh, conspicuous when it comes to environmental justice issues. And that's why I think it was so important to have these discussions about how we talk about ecologically unequal exchange. We had uh, contributions by people who have been working on ecological footprints um, and uh, CO2 emissions. We have people working on biodiversity, uh, life cycle analysis. Uh, the concept of consumer blindness came up in one presentation. I don't know if you've heard it before. Somebody remarked that it's very close to the Marxian notion of commodity fetishism. And of course, the idea is that when we purchase a commodity in a supermarket in Europe or North America or wherever, we do not see the ecological and social consequences of that act of consumption. We do not see the, the destroyed landscapes and the, the uh, impoverished people uh, who suffer from our consumption in the North. Um, and this, I think, consumer blindness is an excellent way of talking about it, but we could actually go back to the classic Marxian expression, commodity fetishism, which basically says the same thing. Uh, we had a very interesting presentation, I think, on the ideological role of certification schemes, uh, showing that all these myriad uh, logos, you know, fair trade, and well, I won't mention any, but there are so many of them around. Uh, and, and the question was asked, and I think it's a very good question, what role do these certification schemes actually have? I mean, it makes us, as consumers, uh, happy about our consumption. Uh, now we have bought ecologically certified products, but the question in the, is ultimately whether we have, through these certification schemes, contributed to maintaining uh, business as usual. Uh, and uh, this, this person who presented this uh, paper actually argued that um, <laughs> certification schemes contributed to ecologically unequal exchange or at least to maintain it, which is uh, an interesting position and quite radical. And we also had a, a brief presentation of the uh, EJOLT map, which you will be hearing more about later on after uh, the break. And um, what else? Well, of course, we had a uh, series of uh, two contributions from Paul Mohai and his students on uh, environmental justice, the history of environmental justice movements in the United States. And uh, I usually think, of course, of the United States as being the point, the nation of origin of this concept of environmental justice. And uh, I think this is where it was first discussed. And I think it's now being widened. And the whole idea of a global environmental justice, uh, as I think Tron mentioned, I think is very, very pertinent, moving beyond the concerns of individual nation states and looking at the logic of environmental justice as an international, a global phenomenon. Um, I'm going to get back to that issue in a little while. We had also some case studies, like you, the one mentioned, Godwin Ojo from Nigeria, also <coughs> Patrick Vaughn from South Africa. We're talking about litigation and, and, and the negotiations that have been occurring in various parts of the world to have recognition and compensation for environmental damages and the, and the problems, the practical uh, and, and sometimes legal problems faced in these negotiations. And uh, speaking of legal issues, we had one presentation on, on uh, precisely the international law system by, by a, a lawyer who, who, who uh, discussed the significances of, significance of the notion of an ecological death from a legal perspective. So you can see the, the enormous variety of perspectives from, from conceptual issues, um, activist uh, perspectives, legal issues, um, biophysical trade balances, and so on and so on. Um, and still there was a very strong convergence, I think, among all the participants 
um, in agreeing on the fact of ecologically unequal exchange. There was nobody challenging it, actually. We were all agreed that we somehow knew what we were talking about, that there was an asymmetric appropriation of resources, an asymmetric transfer of um, natural resources, uh, and, and that extraction, capitalist extraction, was the uh, sort of the driving force here and the, 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 the uh, incentives towards accumulation and profits in the center of the world system. We also had an interesting uh, presentation, a film that was shown from a um, so-called resistance camp in British Columbia, Canada, where a number of people, um, most of them indigenous in origin, were, were resisting the building of pipelines from the tar sands and, and other um, fossil fuel extraction zones. And it was, it, was, um, it was a very useful for us, I think, to see the, the very concrete and tangible level at which these environmental justice struggles are enacted and carried out, to see the, the people, to re hear the voices. And, and, and this, of course, is one of the uh, important tasks of EGOL to connect the activist voices that we hear from all over the world with the kind of more detached and abstract engagement that uh, academics will have in these issues. Um, I'm an anthropologist myself and I worked with uh, Mi'kmaq environmental activists in the early 90s and of course then I can retire into my office and write about it. Um, that's not a luxury that everybody can share and, and as you understand there's some tension or some, um, I guess it, it sometimes you can sense a kind of a distrust uh, particularly between activists and, and academics in terms of our very different circumstances, the very different conditions we have for being engaged in, in environmental justice struggles. But I have the impression that during these two days it was a very strong consensus that we had something to contribute to each other. There was a mutual communication, a mutual understanding going on. Uh, and, and that's the whole idea with, with, with EJOL, which is uh, such a great, great uh, asset, both for the activists and for those of us academics who really want to engage in these uh, issues. And finally, we had a presentation on the medical dimensions of environmental justice. Uh, which goes to show yet once again how, how, how varied the number of contributions were. Um, of course, you all know that there are health risks and, and so on involved in these environmental um, justice issues, and, and uh, the person who presented this had a medical background and could give us some very uh, qualified information on the medical aspects and dimensions of environmental justice. So you can see that the, the sheer variety of of approaches here, uh, I think, is the makings of a very interesting book on ecologically unequal exchange, viewed from many different perspectives, many different scientific perspectives, but also, not least, from a variety of different activist perspectives throughout the world. So, uh, I hope, I only printed 20 of these uh, programs, but I hope uh, most of you have a copy. If not, perhaps you can share them with your neighbor. And if any of you would like, I have added the email addresses to all the people presenting papers. So if any of you, of you have a, a special interest in any of those topics, please, I think I can say that you're free to contact these people and ask them to, to, to uh, share more information on what they're doing. Uh, we look forward to working with this book. Uh, a preliminary suggestion is that Juan and I will, will edit a conference volume emerging from this uh, 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 workshop. And um, both Bia and I have been in touch with Routledge, and they seem very keen, very eager to publish this conference volume, probably in a series of, of EGOL reports that will emerge from this project. So it's, it's, um, it's a very stimulating and wonderful collaboration, I think. Um, I'd like to get back to the issue of environmental justice um, because um, as, as a general concept uh, because I, I, it struck me, uh, I don't know if it was during the conference or just prior to it, that, that I, and of course I want to have your feedback on this call and Juan and so on, but I, I think it's possible to approach the notion of environmental justice 
like an onion, uh, as, a, as, as something, as a phenomenon with several layers. And Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, why? What do I mean by an onion? I mean that uh, a concept, for example, like environmental racism, which is very widespread in, in North America, and it was used, for example, in the environmental struggle that I worked with in, in Nova Scotia, uh, an indigenous group that found that it was systematically being um, uh, victimized by various kinds of um, industrial and extractivist projects. I mean, uh, one year there's the effluent from a pulp mill that is sited just beside the, an, an Indian reserve. Next year there's a huge mining operation in one of the Mi'kmaq people's most sacred mountains. Uh, and then, of course, the deforestation, which at that time was run by a Swedish-owned company, uh, Stora, Stora Kofferberg at that time, um, and so on and so on. So there was this whole idea that why should we, native people, in Canada they say First Nation, why should we be the primary victims of industrial progress? Why do we always wind up with the waste, the garbage, the effluents? And um, at that level, of course, and of course the same has been shown in the United States, people of color, Afro-Americans, uh, uh, Hispanics, and so on, are very often uh, victimized by these uh, problems of environmental deterioration. And of course, uh, at one level it looks like racism, pure simple racism. Let's put the garbage where the colored people live. Uh, but, of course, that is not the whole truth. That is sort of the, the top layer of the whole thing. But, of course, the next layer would be to ask why? Why is there such a high coincidence of environmental deterioration and, uh, and non-Caucasian populations, you know? And then you have to start looking at the economic conditions which uh, contribute to people getting high wage versus low wage jobs and, and, and kind of a perhaps perhaps racism appears in that context but uh, I don't think it starts with the siting of industries uh, so you have to go deeper, you have to peel away those layers of the onion and look at the way capitalist economics function and then you have taken the step from sort of ethics and solidarity to ideology, I think, and a critique of political economy. Um, I mean, it's very easy to agree that we should not be racist. I mean, I, I have never heard anybody disagree with that. But how many would take this step and say we should not have capitalism? You know, that, that makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, uh, if, if, if actually these processes are part and parcel mm -hmm of the market system, the fact that low-wage people and garbage dumps will be located in the same places because of the logic of the market. Then the question is, <coughs> does opposing environmental racism also mean that we're opposed to the market system and its logic? Uh, and yet we have not peeled all the layers of the onion because we can go much deeper. Uh, we can look at the biophysical metabolism of the world system. We could look at the way technological progress always relies on extractivism and how the whole metabolic process by which resources are extracted and transformed through industry uh, is actually due to the combination of the second law of thermodynamics and the operation of market principles inexorably leads to environmental injustice. So we can go sort of from, from, from ethics to ideology to epistemology, I would argue, because the epistemological dimension is to understand technology in a new way. All of this material infrastructure that we see around us in, in affluent countries is always based on extractive activities far beyond our perspective. So uh, when we start uh, untangling the concept of environmental injustice and ecologically unequal exchange, we reveal new layers of the onion 
Uh, and it's not, not just racism. It's not just the market. Uh, if we go even deeper, we can see it has to do with the physical metabolism of industrial capitalist society. At least that's the way I would, I would look at it. Um, and, and this also raises issues. I, I mentioned before the question of, of language. Um, I, I feel, I'll, I'll be very frank with you, I feel a very strong uh, uh, sympathy toward a lot of the ideas that have come out of the Marxian tradition, the Marxist tradition. Uh, for example, the work of John Bellamy Foster on, on, on ecological Marxism. But I, I do think that there is a problem here in terms of how we talk about ecologically unequal exchange. From a, and this was actually my own paper, if I may just briefly summarize it. Um, I don't have PowerPoint. But, um, because um, in the Marxian tradition, there is this idea that uh, accumulation and surplus value and profit is uh, generated through the, <coughs> I guess, uh, I have to use a word now that a Marxian, uh, an orthodox Marxist would, would agree with, but I would say it is undercompensated in some sense. There isn't, the idea of unequal exchange is, is very firmly uh, embedded in the Marxist traditional ideas. Uh, and, and I think that that tradition has inspired a lot of the work on even ecologically unequal exchange, indirectly perhaps. It began with the work on unequal exchange in the economic sense. You know, Argiri Emanuel in 1972, who was arguing that uh, the embodied labor in commodities traded on the world market was being underpaid because of the differences in <coughs> wages between different countries. So, like, uh, to take just a hypothetical figure, uh, uh, an export product from Peru um, uh, would embody more hours of labor than whatever could be exchanged for it on the market from Sweden, for example. It was an unequal exchange of labor. And this was conceptualized as <coughs> sort of the undercompensation of what the Marxians, Marxians call use value. I, I noticed you mentioned the word use value at one point. And, and for me as an anthropologist, I must say that the, pro, the, the concept of use value is very difficult to, to relate to because uh, I, we have had classical work by people like Marshall Salins and others who have shown that all utility, everything that we consider useful, everything that we purchase, all consumption is based on our cultural preferences. Now, if this sounds strange and abstract, let me just give you very one very brief example. What would be the use value of pork for a Muslim or a Jew? <coughs> you see what I mean? It's, very, it's impossible to find some kind of culturally neutral uh, material measure of use value. <coughs> and, and in fact, my, my criticism of this concept of use value has two parts. One is, it cannot be measured in money. Uh, I mean, it, it just simply cannot. How can use value? The, the, we're talking here about physical labor. We're talking about the natural resources and, that are extracted from ecosystems. If it cannot be measured in money, how can you say that it has been underpaid? How can you say that energy has been underpaid or a hectare mm -hmm. of land? What do we mean by underpay? It's, it's the vocabulary of the market that is being expanded here to colonize our understanding of biophysical exchanges. And I have grown in recent years, I've, I've been thinking about this for about 30 years now, but in recent years I've, I've grown very skeptical of the notion of underpayment because it is a word that comes out of the market. And the market is simply not giving us the right vocabulary to talk about these things. The same thing goes for use value. A use value is culturally defined. And uh, it cannot be measured in money, uh, nor can it be measured in biophysical metrics, because it is cultural. So the word use value is in itself a misnomer, I would argue. So 
I would, that, that's the argument I'm currently having with John Lonnie Foster, I must tell you. And, and what, what can we replace that with? I think that many of the presentations that were given at this workshop gave us a completely different way of approaching the problem. Forget about money. We, were, we seem to be all agreed about the fact that the way economists talk about world trade will not help us in any way. We need to, to consider the fact that far beyond the whole domain of money and value and exchange value and price and market and all of this that runs our lives, we have net transfers of physical resources that can be measured in other metrics such as tons, jowls, hectares, uh, and whatever. And these are not metrics that should be sort of colonized by economics in terms of words like values or ecosystem services or natural capital. There are so many examples of how environmental economics have tried to, to encompass the, the field of, of, of extraction, for example, natural resource extraction. So I think we should really think in terms of incommensurability here. I, this is a point that Joan has been making over many years. We need different languages. I mean, we, we cannot simply assume that economics, or even, even Marxian economics, will be able to provide the correct vocabulary for understanding unequal, ecologically unequal exchange. We need to radically dissociate money from physics, economics from physics. Well, that's my personal union. OK, I, I, I've been going on too long now. I but, say, <laughs> but I think we're going to take 10 minutes of questions yeah, and, and discussions. Huh? Yes? Okay. I can take the questions if you want. Please, Lawrence. We take. We take. Uh, you prefer to answer directly the question, or we take. One three could questions. note is that this exchange with Fedemi Foster, which is not the first we have, both you and me, is published now in the Journal of Peasant Studies. Or will be your reply. Isn't it? <coughs> yes. So he wrote a long article recently. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry for being so, being so preoccupied with this, but it's like Juan says, it's a currently ongoing polemic in the Journal of Peasant Studies. He says that Howard Odom is the true Marxist with this discovery. So, so please, Lawrence. This is probably more a question and more a comment. Right? Uh, here, myself, but it's an This is more of a comment than a question. You were talking about the need to be cautious about how we use language. I'm just, I was, I was struck. It's already published here. <laughs> 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 yeah. And it arose because we had a discussion about good trade from Cameroon. Somebody, this was a few years ago. But, but and somebody this, said, this you Europeans don't know what you are buying. But it's all of these things. Like, like, people say, oh, that's crazy. Well, actually, no, it's actually quite rational, this stuff. I'm crazy. That's rational. Very Charlie, because um, actually, when this concept was was presented, 
it was actually to contest the, con the, 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 con the concept of consumer blindness because it was presented by uh, an organization that's actually a consumer's organization. The argument was, uh, oh, so in this way, uh, consumers are, 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 uh, are blamed but for the whole uh, cycle of injustice, while consumers don't have kind of, are, are basically a piece of, 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 a, of a broader me mechanism. So in this in this uh, discussion, we said well, maybe we could develop the concept of cons consumers blinding. I don't know whether this helps. Yeah, uh, personally, I I, I don't think it's such a bad concept. Yeah, I, I I think is it part of a wider problem of dissociation? I would argue, the fact that we 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 which is always a problematic concept, but people who live affluent lives in Europe, North America, and so on tend to not want to know what their real role in the world is and what the connection is between them and, and, and people who are being impoverished in impoverished landscape. So the dissociation that we can see in so many instances of, I think it is, I think it's consumer blindness is a concept that tries to catch it. I mean, we have, we're blindfolded. We don't see what's going on out there. So it's not that bad. <laughs> okay. You may have some relatives who were uh, Ring, a gold ring, so you can ask them whether they know where the gold is coming from, whether it's been certified. Or whether. Is there oh, another question. comment, question? Please, sir. Just a quick one to follow up on that. This notion of blindness uh, 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 falls back, it seems to me, to an old category of ideology. Is that up to us? The scholars, the academics, the intellectuals to illuminate the veil and to educate those who do not know because they're blind. I think this is radically mistaken today, and I would actually question this idea that people do not know. I actually think they know extremely well what's going on. Everyone knows when they walk into a cheap clothing shop that their, their five year old sweater is done by sweater labor in China. Everyone knows that. But despite the fact that they know very well what they're doing, they act as if they not know. And I think that may be a much more powerful way to think of ideology today than this notion of blindness that they do not know. I would argue that. Well, some blindness is fake, right? I mean, I think it's a ma matter of putting, putting, you know, stops for your vision. You don't want to see what's going on. And in fact, I've had a number of uh, discussions with economists who are seriously arguing that the best thing we can do for the global south or for China is to consume as much as possible of their commodities because it's going to help them develop and become sustainable in the long run. So there is an argument about this, which is very, very different from, I think, what you and I would agree on. Is that somebody else wants to intervene? No, I, I do have a question I know, uh, on environmental justice because I've been very much inspired since the first time I read the Environmentalism of the Poor by the environmental justice uh, uh, concepts and instruments uh, and I think also in terms of uh, um, cooperation and collaboration with activists uh, and the fact that concepts from the struggle are brought to scholarly attention is really interesting but I was wondering if uh, uh, also, is there some kind of criticism uh, uh, among uh, people studying environmental justice towards uh, move social movements and environmental movements uh, um, in, in some cases when their projects uh, may turn out not so progressive? In, because I never found the real criticism inside the EJ literature uh, uh, toward those movements uh, that are, you know, poor people or uh, victimized people. And for example, I was thinking to the waste wars in Delhi uh, and the fact that waste pickers, uh, uh, of course, protest because they are uh, losing uh, the, uh, um, their access to waste uh, and so the source uh, for their livelihoods. But in a sense, the fact of uh, asking for having waste uh, can be on a global level in terms also of physical metabolism uh, quite uh, you know, n not progressive agenda, really, if we look at it uh, also in terms of, uh, you know, broader scale. 
No, the point about this case, which I know is, is not so clear, that case like people fighting eucalyptus, for instance, is that they make several points. One, is, well, like, like the right to livelihood, isn't it? In a very, not a nice business. The, the second point is that they are recycling and therefore they diminish the inputs into the economy, although this one would have to look at it, whether this is good or bad, or with life cycle analysis, which I think would be out of the context in a way. The third point they are making now, because they have learned to do it, like, like Via Campesina has learned to do it for peasant agriculture, that what they do is good, not for the environment in general, for against climate change. Well, it's an interesting hypothesis. Is this better than incinerating, making money with incineration, and even claiming carbon credits because you are decreasing the methane, and therefore the companies doing incineration, they get money for producing perhaps dioxin, isn't it? No, sh the, sure. So this is a general question, but... Maybe there is something even... That back. you can put a class mm. angle mm. or a rich poor people angle on the dispute. And therefore, the alternatives would be, as one sees somewhere in the world, like Porto Alegre, for instance, these cooperatives of recyclers making a poor living, but in a more better social situation. So there are many alternatives growing that can grow up of this. In Bogota, the mayor has been dismissed, partly because he tried to expropriate the waste from the from the uh, waste companies mm -hmm. belonging to the Uribe family mm -hmm. and to install this kind of cooperatives. Yeah. So, but, but you have a point. I don't think that all alternatives coming from these movements are always good for the people themselves, perhaps. But there are so many. So the, the resistance produced the alternatives, like water harvesting in India at village level. Is this a really good but you probably could find discussions on this also. But this is how I see it, at least. That from this general movement of resistances, the alternatives come. And also from the brain of somebody, from the brain of people thinking about alternative money or so on. But this is very different in a way, although there are connections with the decroissant movement in Europe, which really must more post-material in the sense of and does not come so much from the real social issue. We're going to have another hour on conflicts and justices, including a lecture on the origins of the environmental justice movement in the state. So we can, okay. instead of talking so yes. much, we should listen. So, so Giacomo, and the last question, because yes. so we want no, to. No, I want to thank uh, Hans von I mean, your, your, your talk was very interesting, very stimulating stimulating and I think you need more than two hours to discuss so you open up in, in, in your talk. But at, at least I, I think since Joan Stark wrote about uh, we com uh, commensurability mm -hmm. and uh, pluralism of languages of values, uh, a new theory of value has been really important uh, discussion uh, among at least uh, ecological economists. Uh, and I think uh, it's emerging also in different contexts. Uh, and for example, I know now, uh, let's say, technological driven project that's called peer to peer value, that also is trying to, to look at how the value is <coughs> really realized nowadays and how it's captured by, let's say, international elite and so on and so forth. Uh, but I, I would like to have uh, at least some. Uh, some some comments uh, from you, uh, not for, from the perspective of a different possible unit that we can use now, because kilogram uh, jumps and so on and so far, that open up the, the possibility to look at the different uh, um, um, arranged uh, exchange uh, context. But the way in which you operationalize it, it's very important. I mean, we are already there. I mean, we have a lot of indicators uh, because of, let's say, multi criteria activity and so on. So we have the unit. We know how to measure it. But how to operationalize it in a proper 
society in which you need to exchange things. I mean, it's very complicated because then I, I, I think all, it's almost improbable to ask for a person, let's say, going in a market and say, okay, I have to trade this in, I give you one, uh, one euro, three joules, uh, five uh, kilograms of potatoes, and so on and so forth. I mean, it will be a messy market. So how we figure out new, uh, new uh, arrangement of interchange in a more plural way, I mean, it's very complicated. What is your take if you have some reflection on it? Or yeah, I do have some reflections. Like you said, it's going to take <coughs> some time. But I, I would like to, first of all, I'd like to suggest, as Ron also mentioned, that uh, this, this connection between uh, Marxian value theory and the value, the energy value theory of, of Howard Odom, for example, which John Bellamy Foster has just been expanding on and endorsing, uh, actually illustrates the problem of looking for a theory of value. I think we should abandon that project altogether because value is a word that comes out of mercantile capitalism in the 1500s. It's, 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 a, it's a word that comes out of the market. Why should we think in terms of value when we're talking about nature, we're talking about unequal exchange, we're talking about extraction and impoverishment. Why should we think that there is a value uh, I mean, one very sim simple, even simplistic way of saying this would be to say that money cannot compensate for entropy. Now, if money cannot compensate for entropy, then uh, we cannot talk about uh, paying for use values or compensating for use values. Even if you go back to Aguirre Emanuel in 1972 and see what is he actually using as a metric for calculating the unequal exchange of labor value, it's dollars. So if use value is to be measured in dollars, you know, that really makes less of a case for finding a metric that is opposed to the market metric. But, but very, very briefly, I, I think the solution, I mean, of course, this looks very pessimistic, uh, but the solution, I think, has to do with finding not new technologies, I'm very critical of and skeptical of, of that approach, but of finding a new currency system, a new monetary system. Because, uh, okay, we can't change the second law of thermodynamics, but we can change the economic system. And I guess it relates also to Juan's uh, notion of incommensurability, that I would suggest we need at least two currencies. We need a complementary currency. Uh, you can Google it. There's quite a lot of people out there who are endorsing it. Um, which is actually only to be used for local exchanges. Uh, and that would, that would produce a very different, well, I can't get into that now, but that would produce a very different logic in terms of making it rational for individual consumers and households to become sustainable. Today, the most rational thing we can do is to be as unsustainable as we can. But we need to have a currency system that makes it rational. And, and I had, I had, I had you know, worked on it, but uh, it's going to take too long to talk yeah. about it. But I think changing and the money system, that would be my, my primary response. Okay. I don't know if was, that was the answer you expected, but it's what I would respond. Okay. Let's say now we have a break of 10 minutes, and we come back here in 10 minutes. So we can have the second part. 10 minutes because we have lots of things to do. Sometimes.